Yeah, so um, this talk is about Absinthe. It's a uh, framework to automatically find uh, sources of side channels in hardware and uh, targets of side channels in software. So, uh, but we're, this is a, shall we say, classical side channels paper. So we're going to exploit um, secret dependent control flow. So it's old style, but with a new twist, which is that we're going to um, concentrate on sources of side channels that are uh, different from classical. So we're not going to use caches or any other stateful components. We're going to use stateful, stateless components, which is a fairly new phenomenon in the side channels world. We're going to automatically find them, and we're going to automatically apply them to arbitrary software targets. So let's see how that is going to go. So the idea is maybe you have some software, maybe it's your own, maybe it's someone else's, uh, and, um, you, if, and what you want is that the code is uh, safe against side channels. Or maybe you want to find out whether it's safe against side channels. But uh, it could be that the, um, after you put it through the compiler, it might do some kind of optimization that uh, makes it, uh, that introduces a secret dependent behavior. Uh, there could be a microarchitectural effect that makes this, uh, uh, that introduces some kind of secret dependent behavior. And we want to, even if the code is good, you're not completely sure if you change compilers or optimization settings or architectures or microarchitectures whether you're still safe. So let's, let's try and automatically test that. Okay. I have since, so I did this work at the Fu University in Amsterdam last year. I have since then become an employee of Intel Corporation. And um, this slide is a legal disclaimer saying that I'm not speaking for Intel in, in this presentation. And uh, these views are not Intel's, they couldn't have them if they wanted. <laughs> Gallows humor. <laughs> okay, so classical side channels. So the observation is that if you have, if there are two hardware threads um, uh, executed concurrently on the same physical core, there are many shared resources which give, which frequently can give rise to side channels. So for instance, we share the same caches, uh, uh, the TLB in some cases, branch predictor state in some cases, the memory hierarchy in some cases, and all of these things when, if you uh, carefully tune a piece of code, spy code to do some operation, measure the latency, then often this latency will depend on whether the other thread is concurrently using that same resource. Um, So in that way, you can uh, observe something about what the, uh, 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 what the other thread is doing. So for instance, the classical, the classical example is you fill up a particular cache set with your own values. You measure the latency, and the latency is low, 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 until, so, until the concurrent executing hyperthread puts something in, the, in that cache set because it has had to access something. Then your latency will go up because you're causing an eviction suddenly, which wasn't there before. But to do this, you have to reverse engineer the behavior of this component. It has a lot of state. Um, all of these components, like the TLB and the cache, or the cache directory, or uh, uh, branch predictors, can have a lot of complicated state that you have to fully understand before you can do attacks like these. And each of them can have a complex addressing function, meaning, well, the thing you want to look up, which is usually some kind of address, uh, is hashed in some way. Uh, that that determines which set you're going to look at something in, which which can have a number of an unknown number of ways. Uh, the cache can have uh, some number of levels with a particular eviction strategy, with a particular re replacement uh, policy, and inclusivity or exclusivity or or uh, or a mixture between those two. And if you don't fully reverse engineer all these properties, you can't really do a reliable side channel attack because you don't know what you're measuring really. So can we? A, avoid all this complexity, but B, also try to find other sources of uh, contention that were maybe previously unknown, because we don't know that they're there. So can we try and find resources that, are, that, don't, that doesn't have all this complicated state, that simply have the state it's in use or it's not in use? And we know some examples of this from, from uh, public information, with, such as uh, execution units or execution ports. We know that the instruction stream of two concurrently executing hyperthreads gets converted into micro operations, which are then just executed in one big pool as backend resources become available in, a, uh, in an uh, out-of-order but dependency-preserving fashion. 
And this means that if we create contention on, it, on any of these resources, such as execution units or ports or maybe something else that we don't know exists, we can uh, create, uh, if the uh, concurrently executing victim thread is, is using any of these resources, we can see this contention and um, create a side channel using this statelessly uh, used resource as opposed to the complicated stateful ones, and in that way maybe find resources that we previously didn't know about. So let's try and automatically find these sources of contention, automatically put together instructions that can differentiate between two different secret dependent code paths of the victim and try and do some uh, crypto attacks. So and what we want to do is, with, without knowing anything really about the CPU, or at least not its innards, only the architectural ISA, the architecturally defined ISA, can we uh, take some, some code and analyze it and find secret dependent branches and then, then do these measurements to see uh, can we, no matter, with any of the tools available to us on the CPU, do some kind of measurement that can distinguish secret uh, dependent code paths. So that means that if the compiler some one day wakes up and decides an optimization that, that uh, destroys your carefully constructed um, constant time code uh, technique, you will notice this. So this was inspired by this blog post by now my colleague, as it happens, uh, Covert Shotgun, called, uh, called Covert, so my colleague Anders Vogue, which is now, uh, and, the, and the project is Covert Shotgun. He calls it Covert Shotgun because he just tries lots of different instructions and then sees uh, and executes all these combinations concurrently on two different threads on, on SMT, as he said here, the, uh, uh, symmetric multi-threading. Um, and if, uh, so he tries to find combinations of instructions that interfere with each other a lot. So for instance, he comes up with this list by hand. So, and he finds many covert channels, and covert channels are not exactly the same as side channels, but it, the, but it is the same mechanism causing the signal, which is resource, resource contention. And he finds many combinations that are indeed covert channels, which is sort of evidence that this approach might work. So as a simple example, let's, uh, the most basic step, this is by the way on ARM, it works on, uh, on, on any CPU with SMT, but uh, this was the first time that we had access, and I think the first time anyone publicly has uh, done experiments like these on an, on an ARM ISA. This is the KVM Thunder X2. So this shows that let's execute two uh, workloads on concurrently executing hyper th on, on threads, I shouldn't say hyper threads, because it's not Intel product but uh, on two hardware threads. And we have a writer side and a reader side. And what the writer does is uh, workload, 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 knob, workload, knob, workload, knob, assuming that knob doesn't use any uh, hardware uh, resources. Not necessarily true, of course, but at least it's different. Um, so it executes the workload in the purple area, if that's visible, and does not execute the workload in the green area. And what the reader does is a different, uh, also a workload when we, we do all combinations. And the reader then constantly measures the latency of its workload. And what we graph in red is what the reader sees. So what we find is that whenever the reader exec executes the, uh, or the two different workloads are either we uh, exercise ALU units or we exercise memory loads. But significantly, the, we do the same kind of loads over and over, so we're not causing any cache evictions. We're just ex exercising the memory subsystem in some way. And what we see is that whenever the writer in the first column is doing ALU, NOP, ALU, NOP, and the reader is doing ALU, 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 the latency goes up if the writer is doing ALU, and the latency goes down, if the, writer's not, if, if the writer's doing knob. Then, if the reader, again in the same column, if the writer's doing ALU and the reader's doing loads, then the latency of the loads is independent of what the writer is doing. And we see a similar pattern in the second column, with the writer's doing loads, 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 knob, loads, knob, loads, knob. 
and the reader is doing LU, then we see nothing. But if the reader is doing loads, then we see this writer-dependent latency pattern. So this means two things. One is that interference can be caused between threads on these stateless resources, because these things do not have any kind of eviction. They're just momentary. Uh, it's momentary resource uh, contention that's either there or it's not, to be independent of state. After, that, after the writer uses the resource, it's free again. So number one, the two conclusions is, number one, um, there exists such cross-thread cross interference. But more significantly, number two, the cross-thread interference can be on different things. So we have this kind of orthogonal behavior between LU ports and the loads of the memory subsystem. So can we, so Anders called his approach covert shotgun because he's just trying many different things. So can we upgrade this from covert shotgun to covert nuke by trying everything? So let's go to this project, uops.info, which provides a uh, machine-readable list of all possible x86 instructions on different microarchitectures. And uh, they also provide some code that lets you generate these, uh, that lets you generate assembly code e executing all these instructions. And then let's do all possible instructions on the writer side and all possible instructions on the reader side and see where do we get the interference patterns. So this is what that looks like on Skylake. For, uh, for, for clarity, we group them by, um, uh, by execution port. And what we see is that, that that port grouping does do a great deal to sort of uh, clarify the picture, but still the ports, the contention pattern that you see, so a brighter color is contention, a latency increase on the reader side to be specific. Um, what you see is that the contention pattern is not fully explained just by ports. So we have these blips, where is my, we have some, uh, blips here that are uh, inside the same groupings of ports are instruction dependent, and we have blips outside the uh, diagonal, meaning we're using different ports, but there's still some interference, like, I'm not sure if you can see that, but here are some yellow blips. So that tells us there are shared resources which are not purely execution ports or execution units, we think, and even if they are, let's try and exploit that. So we do the same thing on Broadwell, we see different interference patterns, and on AMD Zen, we also see different interference patterns, and all not entirely explained by execution units and ports. So now we have this very, it, what, and what's very important here is that the interference pattern is specific to instructions, because if we just see interference, then we still can't distinguish what the victim is doing, because that's what, that's what we ultimately want. But because uh, there's some specificity. We have some hope that finding the right instruction will give us um, distinguishing power between two different secret dependent paths in the victim. Okay, so now what we do next is we try all possible instructions versus a couple of uh, cryptographic targets. And these, have, these are cryptographic uh, targets that have secret dependent control flows. So these are some of the algorithms this is, these are uh, elliptic curve, um, uh, elliptic curve uh, cryptographic algorithms, and the secure thing is a version that does, that tries to minimize secret dependent uh, code, but then just, so it just, it does two operations that would be secret dependent unconditionally, but then conditionally uses the result. And it turns out that, well, we can quantify how successful this was. Uh, so for instance, the ED25519 code here has, we're able to distinguish secret dependent code paths very well because the F score is very, is very high for these instructions. These are thousands of instructions that we tried. And you're gonna need one, of course, but still the trend is, the trend is nice in this histogram. Um, so we can see that adding this sort of secure feature uh, was partly successful, but really at, at all at the end did not really uh, solve the constant time problem at all. And that's an interesting kind of way to, uh, to evaluate measures like this. It's, so um, what we find is that these, uh, we find many instructions which are capable of distinguishing power in, um, 
uh, in these secret dependent paths in these code targets. We tried on three different architectures, which, which also have very different behavior. So that's kind of a nice little survey of all of these available x86 instructions. But in the end, what we really want is the best performing instructions for each target. So let's try and do that and then combine them using like a recipe saying how many instructions do we take, which mixture, which order, do we do it random, do we use memory fences, instruction fences or not. And if we do that and give, uh, and, and give the recipe to a genetic algorithm to try and tune it, to try and increase the, the F score, the reliability score, then we do see that we can slowly but surely increase the score even further if we mix different instructions to try and mix uh, sources of contention. Okay, and this, this uh, signal is actually, in the, in the targets that we tried, this signal is strong enough to do full key recovery, not only distinguish paths, but also on a complete, a complete capture trace, identify the signal that corresponds to particular secrets and do full uh, secret key recovery for uh, one of the targets. But to see how practical it is, we also did this experiment that says, well, if you put this algorithm into GPG and then give, and give the classifier the full execution trace of GPG, where so we give, even give the trace before the crypto starts, can we still do key recovery? Can it, is it robust enough to recognize uh, when the key recovery, when the when the crypto really starts? And we find that it is. So here is the start. Let's see where we are. Uh, uh, okay, here we go. So here is the start of the GPG execution, and then here is the start of the actual uh, crypto operation, the signing operation. And you can see that here is, so th and this, this blob here is ground truth, and this is the classifier predicting crypto bits. So it's not like it's not predicting anything here, but this is clearly different behavior where you can say, oh yeah, so this is, this is where the action is. Here, uh, this is also noise resistance. On the right, we, uh, we schedule a process in the middle of the, spy, um, of the spy process and a process in the middle of the target process and do a varying amount of, and we make it claim a varying amount of uh, CPU time. And the color indicate how successful are you in full key recovery under such conditions. So up to about three or 5% of noise in the spy, we could do, do, still do a very good job of actually recovering the key and interrupt, but more than 5% then the signal's too destroyed for practical, uh, practical recovery. But in the target, if we uh, schedule this noisy process in the target, then we're actually okay. There's still quite a, a lot of interruptions you can do while still being able to uh, reconstruct the signal automatically. So these are some reliability numbers of uh, full end-to-end -end key recovery using some of the automatically generated instruction sequences. So for the, for the case where we give it the beginning and end, we have uh, seven out of seven successful trials with a very reasonable amount of median brute force time. And when GPG is included, we have, well, a practical amount of key recovery, but it, it does take a little more brute force and the success rate is a little lower. All right, so the conclusion is, uh, as I see it is that Absinthe is a useful side channel analysis kit. We can see without knowing too much of a CPU or a compiler or of the target code, we can analyze for side channels. So whether it's someone else's code or your own code that you want to verify for side channels, maybe if you change compilers or change architectures or change microarchitectures, you can use this kind of analysis to verify, <laughs> verify the absence in a particular scope of side channels. Uh, we find some new side channels of uh, sources of contention that were previously unknown, and, uh, and that's the end of my story. Thank you for listening. Okay, so if you have questions, please uh, come up and uh, state your name and uh, affiliation. So I, I have actually have a quick question. So, yep. um, so b basically you are doing this, uh, you know, uh, search over possible instruction sequences. Yes. So I, I didn't get the idea about you know how, how big the search space is, space is. For example, each even for one instruction, you can have different operands, you know, uh, different uh, addressing modes. There, 
so how long does it take to do this search, and uh, how long is this uh, window of this uh, instruction sequence? Yeah, uh, good question. So we, um, so it's it's what the assumption that we made is that the operands probably don't matter for side channel uh, signal for for which resource it uses. But uh, so we don't vary those. We simply take the naive, naive approach of the, to just doing very simple constant operands. And, but indeed, for addressing modes, the XML file that we use to generate all possible code also includes all possible addressing modes. So we, we do sort of brute force those. And in the end, if I remember right, it's, it's around uh, 1,800 combinations of instructions. So we try all 1,800. And, um, and that takes quite a lot of time. It's, it's been a while, but I, I, I would guess maybe it's around 12 hours to try all, try all of these instructions. But then separately from that, we just take the, the best performing ones and then separately do the combination and the tuning. And that, yeah, also takes a similar amount of time as that. Okay, so could there be non-deterministic uh, effects that, that's going on even for, you know? A, a lot, yeah. I think, I think the, this whole process is so dependent on um, what happens to be going on at that time. So we, we try to, to reduce the effect of that by just doing many repetitions. So we, many of these experiments, the F score is based on multiple trials. Okay. So we, we try to minimize that effect, but it'll there'll definitely be noise. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, uh, basic question, right? Um, if you're recovering a key, right, you need, need to know the code that is running, right? And, and yes. you need to know when it starts and stops, right? And, yes. And so then on one thread, you're running this code. And so presumably, I mean, I've seen some other side channel chance attacks where if you know, a request goes in, if a TLRS request goes in, then you understand. So you have some in this framework concept of, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, how you do that? I mean, because yeah. you need to know, know when, say, a given routine starts relative to your you know, exercising of the side channel, right? Yeah, that's okay. that's right. That's uh, that's a good question. Um, and there is uh, so to a part for, to a certain degree, we don't consider that. We just assume well, you have to know roughly when the operation is happening. But this experiment is intended to demonstrate. Well, we are a little bit robust against that. So we you see, can see here, this is a full execution trace of GPG when it's starting up and first, and then the crypto operation happens. And this is a chart of uh, the, the classifier predicting how many real bits of uh, secret crypto bits does the classifier think it's seeing. So what it, ideally, it would be saying zero here because there's no crypto operation happening, but there's a lot of uh, false positives here, but not, but the false positive rate is uh, compared to when the crypto operation really is happening, which is here, is uh, there is quite a big difference. So this. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, this is this is right, right. This, the signal's all yeah tested live, and then afterwards is indeed uh, yeah. So if you were to make this, and this is of course a millisecond, but if you were to make or, or 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 three. And if you were to make this hours, then I don't know if you could spot this, honestly. That might be the next paper. But, <laughs> but there, this is some evidence that there's some uh, robustness to non-crypto stuff happening. That's the, that's the best I can do there. <laughs> OK, let's thank the speaker again.